War. War will never change. Often that is the opening line to a video game or a movie based around a war of some kind. However, this is not fake. This is reality. The things you are about to learn are as close to accurate as could be. But with all things, you should do your own research and simply take this documentary as a stepping stone to deep diving into the subject of specifically the two wars we are discussing. The first chapter is devoted to war in and of itself. Why throughout all of history, why this is the constant that has never changed. War has not changed. The way we fight, and the reasons why we fight, have. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps. Generals gathered in their masses and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Just like witches at black masses. Evil minds that plot destruction. Sorcerer of death construction. May God bless our country and all who defend her. In the fields of bodies burning. <laughs> Machine keeps turning. Death and hatred to mankind. Poisoning their brainwashed minds. Oh, Lord, yeah. are something that no matter what happens throughout all of history, whether it's the year 2500 or 1872, every country does it, even if sometimes we don't seem to understand exactly why. We have disagreements, but why do we shoot and stab and kill each other over these disagreements? Well, in this chapter, we are taking a look back at the beginning of war and its history way back in ancient Mesopotamia in the year 2700 BC. The great forces of Sumer and Elam, the Sumerians won that battle. This was the first war that was ever recorded. While the exact cause for the war is unknown, many people believe it could be the result of different cultures and societies having to fight over the crops and food that were now becoming scarce necessities. These battles and wars were fought with spears and swords. Another ancient war to take a look at that impacts the way that we fight wars now, and we need to take a look at to understand why wars are the way they are today. The Trojan War that supposedly took place in the 12th or 13th century BC is where the phrase the Trojan Horse comes from. This battle was considered historically inaccurate because of its prevalence in Homer's The Odyssey, as well as the Battle of Troy and the Trojan War itself, providing much of the inspiration and influence into the Greek tragedies. For many years, the idea of the city of Troy itself was in debate until a German archaeologist Heinrich Schleimann met Frank Calvert who together convinced everyone due to their archaeological digs that Troy was probably in what is now considered Hisalerk in Turkey. The reason why the war itself is so highly argued is because there are no historical records that completely depict exactly what happened at this battle. Instead, the records and events are depicted through numerous different retellings, such as the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer, and other poems and stories that were created around the same time. Importantly, now that we know that the city of Troy was probably a real city that did exist, the likelihood that Homer was not writing about complete fiction, but rather what he was seeing around him and hearing from people who had first-hand experiences with this terrible war was much, much greater. The technological advancements of war and fighting are best described as fast and important. We started with exactly how all things started, sticks and stones. Sticks and stones were found lying around the ground. We moved very easily to things like I mentioned earlier, like swords and spears. But this is where things become interesting. We began to use chariots to wheel our soldiers from one place on the battlefield to another. Horse archery became another incredibly popular weapon. 
Placing archers on horseback led to a better vantage point than was otherwise known. Steering back a little bit, the sword's evolution was actually quite interesting. The cutting axe was first invented around 2500 BC. Not long after, the axe evolved into something called the sickle sword, which was a curved concave blade in a thick handle. This sickle sword developed into what we now know as the common everyday sword that you think of. During the Bronze Age, the metals typically used to create a sword were bronze and silver. The blacksmiths of the time were able to use these metals to create tougher, longer swords than the sickle sword which was slightly harder to use, allowing for more room for error. The straight sword meant you picked your target and pointed at it, whereas the concave sword had to adjust for the curvature of the sword as well as it being more fragile. As swords, bows, and other items of offense were increasing in popularity and strength, some people, the smarter ones, were creating items of defense that ultimately saved their lives. The first piece of armor in the way that we understand it was actually not something you expect. The armor was actually just the skins of animals that they had collected from hunting. The next advancement was not in technology, but rather using what was recently discovered and putting it into the already existing piece of technology. When metal was first really utilized in armor, it started by attaching small pieces of metal in the most crucially typically struck or stabbed place, and putting pieces of the metal there to protect it. The next actual advancement in simply the protection was mail, or most commonly known as chainmail. Chainmail, which was basically small metal pieces interlaced with each other, made it much harder to actually stab through it. While it was able to be penetrated, it made the actual damage done to the person much more survivable, as it wasn't able to go as deep into the person than without the chainmail. I know this is a documentary or a video essay, but this TikTok is the best example of what I'm talking about. The link to the creator of this TikTok will be in the description below. Chainmail might be really good at stopping slashes, but how is it if you get stabbed? In response to your question, here's a second question. If you know you're going to get stabbed, would you like to do it while wearing chainmail or not? Like, it's not quite as good at stopping you getting stabbed as it is stopping you getting slashed, but you'd definitely rather have it than not, right? Something else to consider, especially if we're talking medieval Europe around the 14th, 15th century, is that the swords can get quite long. Like, if young Master Melon here wants to avenge his father's death, it's going to be a lot easier for me to cut him down by using this huge length of blade rather than just focusing on the tiny bit at the end. Boop! But let's test it out. Here it is without the armour. Pretty easy. Here it is with the armour. A lot harder. And here it is with armour and padding. A big cut, a little cut, and a little dent. Chainmail was only really utilised between the 10th and 13th AD. The issue was, yes, while this chainmail was available, it was so expensive only the high class ever was able to afford it, which made its accessibility very limited. So it was eventually replaced by sheets of metal and reinforced with the chainmail. Knee joints and elbow joints were eventually created to allow for full movement of joints to make it easier to protect yourself from or harm your opponents. Armor would eventually become so advanced it can stop a bullet flying at an average speed of 2700 feet per second. The rate of development with armor never catches up to the worst weapons we can possibly imagine. When the limit of destruction is our own imagination, what can possibly stop us? This may all be sounding like your 15th playthrough of Skyrim, but I can promise you I won't be telling you there are many magic spells in this ancient warfare. What's important to see throughout all of this is the way that things evolved. Instead of evolving our abilities to discuss things or work out the issues we have, we have chosen to evolve the way we take the innocent lives of those sent out into battle for a cause. We take the innocent lives of the young people of our country and send them to war with the knowledge that most of them will not come back. Even if they do, they'll be torn up and riddled with PTSD, unlike anything anyone was ever ready for. PTSD replaces the enemy with one's own mind. We might have progressed past the point of using swords, axes, bow and arrows, and horses on the battlefield. But we might as well be in the Dark Ages considering how much knowledge we have and how we have treated the ones that actually go out to fight for us in the battles that the government decides. For decades, we treated PTSD as if it was to be ignored and just recently we have come to understand its full effects on humanity. PTSD, or short for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, can have many causes and many symptoms. Most cases of PTSD are triggered by some type of traumatic event. This can be almost anything that the brain would try to protect itself from. If you were in or witness to a serious accident, in a war, suffered from physical, emotional, or sexual abuse amongst countless, countless things, you may develop PTSD. 
For the case of this documentary, people suffering with PTSD from being in a war or being in the army is what we're going to be focusing on. PTSD wasn't understood at all, and in fact, didn't exist as an official diagnosis until the year 1980. Star Wars, Jaws, The Exorcist, and The Godfather are all older than PTSD, just as a reference point to how new this diagnosis really is. I want to bring you back to the Summer of Love, the year of flower children, free love, the birth of rock music, hallucinogenics, hate ashbury, anti-consumerism, and of course, Woodstock. This is the side of this era that this generation wants you to remember. They don't want you to remember the Vietnam War that tore so many families apart, and the violent graphic images that were shown on TV every day. The drug addiction that still affects the lives of so many to this very day. The rampant homelessness that ran through the entirety of San Francisco because so many people were flocking to this town to see what all the free love and drugs was all about. Drug dealers preying on the addicts that were literally lining the streets. The riot and subsequent deaths and injuries at the Rolling Stones concert at Altamont. Like everything, the list of positives is just as long as the list of negatives when it comes to the counterculture movement of the late 60s. The hippies are a group of people to learn from, not to imitate. However, one of the worst things to come out of this time that still affects people today are the treatment of the Vietnam vets from both the hippies and the government. Over 65% of soldiers in Vietnam were voluntarily there, while almost 25% of soldiers were drafted. The infamous draft that hasn't been used since 1973 caused many people to sign up for either the reserves or a specific section of the military that they wanted to, simply because they were worried they would be drafted into a section of the military that wouldn't suit them very well. So who really knows the amount of people who wanted to be in the military because they actually felt like it was their calling, and how many felt pressure to enlist when they otherwise wouldn't have, which I bet is a pretty good chunk of those who enlisted during this time. The major issue is while the government also did not care about vets, did not care to help them, house them, feed them, those who were counterculture like the hippies would spit on and scream or berate the vets when they came back as if it was the fault of the individual that America was over in Vietnam, when in fact the government was completely to blame for us being over there in the first place. This not only caused the issues that were already present inside the veteran to worsen, but also made them feel shameful and saddened when they were not welcomed when they came home. Many vets from Vietnam were left homeless and still are homeless even to today. PTSD affected so many people and was just left untreated for so long. It's estimated that roughly a quarter of a million people have lasting PTSD effects from the Vietnam War, all these years later. Staging the scene of the Vietnam War is crucial to understanding the reasons why people were coming back with more PTSD and more issues than we had previously understood. America's involvement in Vietnam is very complex and incredibly intricate and just another symptom of America's involvement in things that we otherwise shouldn't have been in. The US's constant war against communism and the pressure in America to act against communism's success in the Chinese Civil War. November 1st, 1955 is the beginning of involvement in Vietnam, and March 29th, 1973 is when the final men were taken out of Vietnam. This was a war that lasted many of the young people of the time's entire lives. This is partially why the amount of protests increased so greatly through the latter half of the 1960s, as people were getting more and more upset by the war. The Vietnam veterans are currently the highest vet group in America right behind the war in the Middle East. There are currently estimated 6.1 to 6.3 million veterans that are still alive, and 5 out of 100 in the past year and 10 out of 100 in their lifetime have suffered from some type of PTSD from Vietnam. Compare this to World War II, or 2 out of 100 in the last year, and 3 out of 100 in their lifetime, and after Vietnam, 14 out of 100 Gulf War veterans in the past year, and 21 out of 100 in their lifetime have all suffered from PTSD. This means that the awareness of PTSD and the issues that arise from being in active combat is slowly becoming more and more understood, thankfully. PTSD is one of the worst possible non-physical things someone can come back from war with, simply because of what PTSD actually does to people. It can cause people to become drug or alcohol addicts, lash out at people trying to wake them up. Being incredibly scared of loud noises as well as so many minor symptoms, they're all very hard to list here. The hardest part to discuss is how often people with PTSD attempt or commit suicide. 19 out of 100 people have made an attempt to take their own life, and 15 more have had constant thoughts of suicide since being in Vietnam. Sadly, it's estimated that about 9,000 people have actually committed suicide since the 80s. Suicide is such a rarely talked about fact that these numbers may be much higher than we think. If you are a veteran, 
know someone who is a veteran, or otherwise struggle with suicide issues, please call or text 1-800-442-4673. The darkness has to come before the dawn. PTSD has to be one of the most terrifying things the war has ever given to humanity. The battles may be physical and eventually end, but for those who suffer from PTSD, the battle is entirely mental and may never end. If these issues are caused by war, why do we continue to fight in a new war every other year? The answer is like the root of all other evil in the world. Money. Directly after 9-11, America was fully on board going after those who we perceived did the acts rather than actually looking at the facts of who did what, and most importantly, was the ending truly worth the cost. George W. Bush signed the authorization for the use of military force on September 18, 2001. Since that day, the U.S. has spent $8 trillion in the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere. For full transparency, portions of that does include post-war bed affairs, payments of war borrowing, increases to homeland security, and Pentagon increases to war-related issues. But it's still all directly related to the wars directly after 9-11. I tried to convert $8 trillion into the cost of a McDonald's hamburger at this moment, $2.49. But when I put it into a calculator, this is what shot back at me. 3.2128514E times 10.12. So basically, we could have probably solved human homelessness and hunger with the same amount of money we spent to kill one man. America wouldn't be doing that if there wasn't money coming the other way too. And of course there was. But before we get to who is profiting from these wars, let's discuss the true cost of these wars that have spanned my almost entire life. Over 7,000 members of the military have died in America's forever war, and in total, over 940,000 people died from the multiple wars that spread over the nations we invaded. 432,000 of those people were completely innocent civilians who had nothing to do with 9-11, or had any involvement with the military. When discussing wars, especially ones that aren't world wars or something like the Civil War, it's much harder to understand the true horror that is being lapsed onto people by either America's government in this case, or other governments in a lot of cases. Civilians and people who fight are always the ones that pay the price. The governments never have and never will. I want to bring our attention to someone that is truly profiting up the deaths of these 940,000 dead human beings. That would be a name I'm sure you've heard of before, Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is the largest supplier of weapons to the American government. While this isn't the war we are specifically talking about, I can promise you almost nothing has changed between the wars in the Middle East and their Ukrainian war. Lockheed Martin's reported a revenue of $66 billion in 2022, with a profit of $5.7 billion. There's a back order of nearly $150 billion in weapons. Lockheed Martin's weapons sales revenue was nearly $60 billion. Let's just use this next figure to understand how Lockheed Martin directly profits from wars that happen. Lockheed Martin started 2022 worth $98 billion and ended the same year worth $127 billion. What changed? They funded the guns to America to help fight the war in Ukraine. So let's look back for a moment. I was unable to find an exact number for how much they profited from the war, but I can say that five different companies split $3 trillion five ways. Although I'm sure it wasn't exactly even, I'm sure the difference is just minor. The US government spent $10,000 per citizen over the course of the war that we have to pay back in taxes in some way. All while Lockheed Martin profits from it and the average American citizen suffers, and will still suffer. I was literally non-existent when this war started, and wouldn't be born for two more years. But thanks to George W. Bush sending us into a war that wouldn't be over until 2022 when I was 19, the forever war that five companies profited from and hundreds of thousands of people suffered, I was born with a $10,000 debt on my name. Here is an image that must stay in your mind for the hundreds of thousands of people that suffered from the hands of these companies. Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, General Dynamics, and Northrop Grumman Corp. Three trillion dollars, 432,000 innocent men, women, and children dead.
That is the end of the informational aspect of this documentary. But I wanted to do this since this does touch on the side of politics slightly, I wanted to tell you where I stand because while the information is as unbiased as I could find, the presentation will lean towards the politics of whoever was telling it. I lean pretty far left, modern day American terms of far left at least, so the information is 100% factual, but the way it's presented to you is from a left leaning perspective. I hope you enjoyed learning about the history of wars and just different aspects of wars like this. Thank you very much for watching this documentary.